Hi, and welcome to Ornithology. I hope you find this course to be as fascinating as I have found it to be. Now, you might not have thought about it, but in comparison with other taxonomically oriented courses, ornithology is a unique subject in a number of respects. And some of the more notable reasons include the following. One, as a group, birds are the most conspicuous vertebrate animals on the planet. This is not only true in terms of their visual conspicuousness, but true in terms of their vocal conspicuousness as well. I mean, all you have to do is walk outside to confirm that birds are ever-present. Go ahead, walk outside. Which vertebrate organisms do you detect? Birds. That's what you detect. Consequently, birds are readily studied and provide more textbook examples of interesting biological phenomena than do any other group of vertebrates. As a taxonomic group, birds have been more instrumental in the development of theoretical concepts in field biology than most any other group, especially theory in evolution, ecology, and behavior, for example, what about migration, dispersal, population fluctuation, territoriality, foraging ecology, social systems, mating systems, habitat selection, island biogeography, you name it. The point is, exciting mental exercises are an integral part of ornithology, much more so than other taxonomically oriented courses. Two, no other organisms reflect quite so vi visibly and vividly our own predicament on this earth. Because of their conspicuousness, birds serve as good indicators of potential problems. Now, you all know the canary story, where canaries were carried along with coal miners because they were good indicators of deadly carbon monoxide. When the bird falls over dead, it's kind of time to get out of there. By analogy, when you see eagles falling out of the sky, maybe it's time we do something about potential problems. As another result of their conspicuousness, birds can be used to indicate land use effects on many species simultaneously. You can learn about effects on a hundred species just as easily as you can learn about the effects on only one. Wildlife biology has moved, with considerable resistance I might add, from a program of single species game management to one of managing for the maintenance of all species. And birds have come to play an important role in the movement toward more progressive forms of wildlife and ecosystem management. Hey, birds can even be used to predict home values. Take a look at this paper in Urban Ecosystems. Yeah, just send me to your house. I'll get a bird list and tell you what the value of your house is. Because many birds migrate, they also expose the ecological interrelationships of widely separated parts of the globe. And they expose the necessity of working with other nations to be successful in conservation. Birds have even proven to be effective tools for local political decisions as well, like the creation of a downtown wildlife refuge right here on the Clark Fork River right in front of the Boone and Crockett Club. This inner city refuge was created just because one person submitted a long list of species to the city council and then argued that the place was special. Third, the usefulness of birds as management tools has translated into jobs for wildlife biologists as well. In the last year alone, the ornithological newsletter contained well over 450 job advertisements for experienced field ornithologists. Name another taxonomic group for, the, for which this is the case. You can't. Birds have it hands down. Fourth, the use of common names of birds is unique. Birds comprise the only taxonomic group for which there's a committee in the American Ornithologist Union that oversees the nomenclature and ensures there's only one English name for every Latin binomial. This means that learning common names is as good as learning scientific names. Consequently, all we have to deal with in this course are the common names. 
The downside is that there are constant changes in taxonomy and constant changes in the English names as well. For example, a decade ago or so, whistling swan became the tundra swan. Louisiana heron became the tricolored heron. Solitary vireo became Cassin's vireo, and so on and so on. This makes communication difficult because every field guide is quite different and it's really hard to keep up with these name changes. But whatever, we can at least use English names. Fifth, learning to identify birds in the field provides tremendous personal pleasure. It literally adds a new dimension to your world. If you're not a bird watcher already, your perception of the outer doors will never be the same after this course. You will be aware of birds like never before, and you'll see the same places differently than you did before. Now this can be a scary proposition because it's a one-way passage. If you like your world the way it is now, you better drop this course because there's no going back to the world as you knew it once you learn birds. Fortunately, bird watching generally provides a personal pleasure that's so great for many people that seems to become their sole purpose for existence. They plan their every free moment around the possibility of adding a new species to their life list. The public interest in birds has also created an ecotourism boom worldwide. You know, the last statistics were there written $38 billion a year generated through economic value of birding. Such a phenomenon occurs to this extent with no other group of plants or animals. And this has led to an explosion of birding festivals, birding paraphernalia, with obvious economic repercussions. Bird watching is, in fact, the fastest growing outdoor activity in the nation, like faster than walking. And ecotourists are taking advantage of this fact. Let's face it, people love birds. People also get into the competitive side of bird watching. Here's an article on the big day the uh, Montanans take part in, trying to see how many birds they can see in a single day. And of course, there's a national competition too, the World Series of Birding, and a movie now out about this phenomenon. Sixth, because of the popularity of birding, the general public is involved in the science of ornithology to an extent unmatched by any other field in science. If stock photography is the first industry to be transformed by crowdsourcing, then ornithology is the first academic discipline to undergo the same process. Amazing. Millions of people provide real data from their bird feeders, from Christmas bird counts, from breeding surveys, and now from simply reporting what they see on casual bird walking, uh, watching expeditions while they're in the field. The use of so-called citizen scientists has led to discoveries that would otherwise not have been possible. Here's an example of some information about the explosion of crows in Missoula, just from the Christmas bird count data. And from people sitting at their feeders for one or two days in February every year, we get data like these. Notice here is a common red pole in 1989, and they're right on the border of the U.S. and Canada for the most part, across the nation. Here's 1990. Whoa. 91, oh my gosh, they're all the way in Canada. 92, oh, they're back down to the U.S. 93, oh, oh, back in Canada, hardly any in the U.S. 94, ah, back down to the U.S. 95, there's none unless you go to Alaska. 96, oh, they're back again. You get the idea. Uh, it's amazing what we can learn from people contributing their information from their own house. And as I noted, now there's eBird, where people can contribute data to the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology from their iPhones on any day, any time, from anywhere in the world. The phenomenal growth in eBird is shown here in this slide at the top of the National Audubon Society Christmas Bird Count. You know, there's 2,000 points or, or places where this happens nationally. Maybe 4,000 places where we have breeding bird surveys. But look at eBird at the bottom, 1.2 million observations every month. Take a look at what you can learn from uh, the seasonal distribution detail you can learn, picked up from millions of citizen scientists submitting their observations every month. 
Okay, let's take a look at where rough-winged swallows occur at all times of the year uh, in the lower 48 based on observations submitted by millions of people to eBird. Okay, so we go from January to December on the bottom here, and away we go. January. Oh my gosh, southern Arizona. There's some rough-winged swallows. Oh, the Colorado River Basin there. Oh, there they are. They're coming to the east, Tennessee. Oh my gosh, the whole eastern United States, April to May. Jeez, Louise, look at Montana's finally getting some swallows. It's into June. Oh, they're fading on already. End of June, into July. We don't have them anymore. They're all over the Ohio River Valley in California. Mississippi River, Colorado River, Mississippi. Holy cow, look how important that must be for fall migration. Down to Louisiana coast, September, October, by November, whoosh, they're gone. South America. The last thing that's unique about birds is that when you become an ornithologist, you become part of a group of people that are the most outwardly friendly people in the world. Binoculars around your neck are like keys to a city. They open doors in amazing ways. Two people with binoculars are attracted to one another like two magnets. It's amazing. When I was in Mexico trying to find and follow bird flocks in some palm plantations in San Blas, Nayarit, for my dissertation work, a lady with binoculars came up to me to see what I was looking at before suggesting and showing me additional places where I could find good warbler flocks. After more conversation, I eventually discovered that it was Aldo Leopold's daughter, Estella, who helped me find birds that day and who later invited me for dinner to her hotel because it was apparent to her that I was a starving graduate student. So, ornithology may turn out to be a unique experience for you. It might even change your life. I hope you enjoy the journey.